Good evening, chess friends, and welcome to today's chess practice on YouTube. What I'm going to talk about today is the difference between tactics and strategy. More importantly, I'd like to speak about how you can make a difference between those two and essentially decide on which one is more important and when. So I'm going to bring up some of the most valuable techniques of deciding when to choose playing more to play more tactically and when to choose playing more positionally. Now, I want to tell you that both of these are essentially important. I've met players who've told me, Valeri, you know, tactics is all that I need to do. And others who say, no, strategy is all I need to do. And while I've always said that strategy is more relevant, more important to study, I can tell you that without good tactics, strategy itself is not going to help you win the game. So today I'm going to bring you some really good examples which will show you the importance of both and how you can get the most essential knowledge to become successful with your games, whether you're going to play more tactically or more positionally. Now, don't worry, it's not going to be just a narration. We're going to make it an interactive lecture. I've got some many questions for you. But for those of you who want to learn most, I would really want to encourage you to take a look at the link below the lecture. There's a fantastic package um, by, um, I think, with Chess24 with only Grandmaster courses, 49 Grandmaster courses, which is only available at uh, with a 60% discount for the next uh, few hours, I think, 10 or 11 hours. And it's really good because you get to see some of the best Grandmasters of our time, like some of the best chess trainers, like Arthur Yusupov, Jan Gustafsson, uh, Robin van Kampen, and, and you know some of some young Grandmasters like, like Ivan Saric, for instance, and even the top GM Piotr Svidler. It's a it's fantastic to see this course that is based on opening, middle game, and end game study. But more importantly, it covers what we're going to be talking about today, which is essentially how to you know comply our strategy with tactical and positional approach. So what I want to bring up first, we're going to start with the fantastic game. I was able to see recently between Vulgar Gashimov, who passed away, I think, a few years ago, and um, Boris Gelfand. This game was played in uh, the Hisp Hispanian Championship in 2009, but it was a fantastic game. I'd like to bring it up to you because Gashimov was able to win it in, like, about 16 moves. It, it, was, it was incredible. It was really, really good. So let's see exactly what happened so that the game can finish so fast. And, uh, okay, let's take a look and see. Now, one thing I would like to clarify, though, while we're looking at this game. You're not supposed to kill your opponent in 16 moves in most of the games. It's just that sometimes when the circumstances arise, you might have such an opportunity. So anyway, white started with e4, black played e5. There was knight f3, knight f6, and that was the Petra of defense. Now, essentially, black's challenge against white's pawn in the center seems very reasonable, and he wants to just put a challenge or attack out there and make it well. So, uh, in fact, after continuing with the move uh, knight f6, white played the move d4, so that the idea is to challenge black's pawn away, and then once black takes it, we have e5, driving the black knight and developing quickly. This is usually what white wants. Of course, black doesn't black that, so he takes. Now here, this is just opening, and it doesn't have any relation to our theme, so if you're wondering why I'm going a little too fast, just so that you know. <clears throat> this is just because I want to go past the opening, because the opening is more or less theory. Everybody can learn the opening more or less for just 15 minutes. The important is what comes after that. White gets the knight. He wanted to really chase away Black's active knight and exchange it. Black didn't want that, so ultimately that helped White to get his own knight pretty strong. And then after exchange takes, Black continued, continued developing, and White did the, very much the same thing with bishop d3. So now here comes my first question to you. Now you probably think that this is a game for White to think about, but I'd like to to ask you, how would you think about this position from the black perspective? 
I think it's a really important position, and Black has to decide where to go. So let's see, guys. What do you think is Black's best move at this moment? What should Black choose to continue? Develop, attack, challenge, gain more space, or probably something else? Now all you're thinking in the chat, C5. Okay, C5. That's what Black did. I mean, I can't blame you for choosing that because exactly this is exactly what Black did. Um, now, uh, but what comes out of C5? It drives that knight out of the way. So what do we do in this position? So first and foremost, after continuing with the move of pawn up to the c5, now that's very important. Black actually is attacking the knight, sure, but more importantly, he is going to lose the f5 square. f5 was already too wide, but the fact is that Black engages tactics at the wrong time. Now, you have to understand that there are two ways to engage tactics. We, could, we would call them provoke tactics, like when you provoke, like what Black did with C5, and when tactics just happen naturally. Now, my suggestion is the following. Before you have the preparation and the readiness and the control of the position, do not, you know, provoke tactics. Because when you do that, you'll risk too much. A lot of the mistakes of intermediate or beginner players happen exactly for this reason. They ultimately... Uh, provoke tactics and it just doesn't work too well. You have to be thinking about it. C5 is bad. I suppose all the black had to do is just cast a short and maybe after that move he would be able to, uh, you know, like castle, probably play G6 or H6. And uh, okay, that's the way to go. Uh, in fact, I would say that if black plays maybe G6 or H6, it's, it's going to be. Normal. He should have done that. I suppose he didn't like it because in the end, White would play c3, castle, do knight f5. But those are just moves. What's so wrong about c5? Now, this move is horrible. You wouldn't see it. And a lot of the, you know, principles in chess, you wouldn't eventually see why they're good or bad. You just know whether it's a good or bad principle. Now, later on, it will become apparent but initially you don't see it, okay? And that's very important. So it's like you set the foundations very thin. Initially you don't get to see how that will affect the house, but then later on, you know, after some time, it will affect it in a very bad way. That's the same thing. You have to be careful. Pushing up with C5 was a grandmaster move that unfortunately failed Black terribly. Well, we'll see how. White played knight f5 here, attacking. So black didn't want to lose the light square bishop, so he was ready to lose his dark square bishop, I guess. After the exchange and retake, he'd take back with the queen, challenge e5, and do well. So what do we do now as white? I'd like you to think carefully and let me know your opinion. What should be white's best way to go? <clears throat> hmm. Now, being active is great, but we also need a, quite a bit of development. The problem is that if we do get to, to, to just do to, to, to development, black can play even a move of pawn up to the c4, and that may not go too well. Yeah, you know, the whole thing is. Well, white's being very active, but how to advance? Now, queen g4 is an interesting suggestion. Sure, I like this. Essentially, if black plays g6, he'd weaken his position. And I think that he would, but then what can we do about it? A little check, king g7, nothing too much. In g7, true, but then black would just take back. Nothing's going to happen. Hmm. Now, I can see quite a few suggestions about knight takes g7 as a move, which I have to say it's, it's pretty. But, you know, before you go ahead with such a move, you better be very careful as what's going to happen.
Now, let me tell you something about tactics. Tactics often are connected with a huge risk. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do them. It just means that you have to be very careful. If you're thinking of a tactical variation, that especially one that revolves around sacrificing a big piece, the one thing to keep you safe, the one thing you need to remember, is that this tactic must either win the game, like give you a big advantage, or it must give you a tremendous pressure and a follow-up to your opponent. If it's not doing that, you better forget about it. Either way, we have to calculate very hard. So let's take a look. Knight takes to the g5, knight takes g7, king takes to the g7, and uh, let's take a look and see. Knight takes b7, and king takes g, perhaps uh, we can consider playing with the move of queen to the h5. Then, uh, all right, black can make a move of rook to the h8 in this moment. Mm -hmm. We're doing good. Then, okay, of course, we could try and play the move, the move of bishop h6 check. He would do king g8. How do we continue? That's a very, very important question. Hmm, what to do now? <clears throat> Anyone? E6, of course. That is perfect. We're going to play the E6, but hang on. If we make the move of pawn up to the E6, then we can attack against the opponent's uh, uh, pawn, but then he's actually going to go for a move of uh, bishop takes to the E6. I mean, E6, bishop takes to the E6. And then what do we do? I mean, e6, bishop takes d. We can. We have a great looking bishop on h6. We have the g7 square there. But then hold on. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's still very blurry here. It's still difficult to figure out where do we go about this. Like e6, he takes. Then what do we do? Anybody? See, I'm not moving the pieces for one reason. Not to make it more difficult for you, but that's how it goes in a real game. You have to think about each of the you know variations kind of slowly so you can find out. So knight takes g7, king takes g7. Okay, just going to make colors. Knight takes g7, king takes g7. Let me remove the arrows, you know. I think it will be easier if I make them over again. Take, take, queen h7, queen h5, rook h8. Then we have bishop h6, king g8. Now, picture that king. It has no good squares where to go. Knight h6 checkmate would have been good if the bishop wasn't there. Then we have e6, bishop takes d. Now, I know this is hard, but that's how you do it in a game. Okay, queen e5, you said. Queen e5 is good. He plays bishop f6. All right. And then, then what do you guys have after bishop f6? The king is limited. It has no squares to go. Imagine that. You know, when a king is limited so much, one check is a checkmate. Just one check we need. Queen g, hey, there we go. We have a winner. Queen g3, and that's a checkmate. And that was it. I mean, you see, you need to see it to the very, till the very end. And yet it helps. This was powerful. Knight takes g7. Remember, sacrifice for the sake of sacrificing, for the sake of being shiny, does not work. I've suffered many times because of that. People love the look of the position. But remember something. In our modern chess, we don't care how it looks. We care what it gives us. So basically, a follow-up with a strong pressure is good enough. Winning something is good enough. Looking good is not good enough. You can't sacrifice for looking good in a certain position. So keeping it solid and attacking at the right time is a matter of discipline, not so much of a knowledge or experience. So after queen h5, black played rook h8. We have the check, and it actually happened just like that. It's incredible to see Boris Gelf on one of the best grandmasters in the world being totally hammered 
in just a few moves. I mean, apparently this doesn't work as we as we calculated due to queen e5 with a checkmating attack here in a checkmate. More importantly, because of that threat and the other threat of queen g3, more importantly, if he takes with f takes d, we still have that queen to g4, which is actually what happened in the game. And uh, black just lost it, queen g7. So it was the it was the end. Now, what are the three key lessons we can draw from this game? Three critical lessons. First lesson, you know, when you play the opening, from the very start of the game, try to build good activity. This means we didn't care so much of what moves white played. As long as he was able to challenge black's advanced pieces and make sure that his own become more advanced. Similar to what I mentioned about concepts. You don't have to know how it works. You just need to know that it works. And the knight on d4 was brilliant. It was great center control, active development for white, and further, that was enhanced by knight, e5, knight f5. Second thing, sacrifices. Now, I've mentioned before in previous webinars about risk factor. Now, whenever we sacrifice, there is a risk. Apparently, people understand it, but still they choose to ignore it. Now, sometimes you can do that, sometimes you shouldn't. I believe you have to just follow that concept. Do you get enough of a follow-up and pressure, or do you get to win immediately? If you cannot answer affirmatively to these two questions, you should better not sacrifice it. White had to calculate very hard and even longer so you can figure out that knight g7 actually works. And more importantly, if you want to do the attack successfully, you need to have threats. That's the fuel of the attack. Every single move that White did was with a threat. Threat, capture, forcing move. A threat in the h7, check. Threat against f7, then check, and then the check. Even if he takes there, there is a threat. There's a check, capture, direct threat. Again and again and again, we don't give him time to take a breath. It's a very simple game, you know, very, very simple game. But it shows the very nature of tactics and how concrete and yet risky they could be when you make them. Okay. So, what was Black's mistake? Thank you for asking. It's a good question. <laughs> Where did Black go wrong? I think he went wrong with the opening development, but I suppose that he should have just not allowed this to happen in the first place. Maybe he should have just played c5 or g6, possibly, something like that. I mean, it's probably better. He At least he wouldn't have to worry about his king. So, Anyway, um, how do you know if a sacrifice is going to work? I think I answered that question. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, now let's go with another instructive game so i've as i've pointed out the themes and the games we're going to be talking about now by the way if anybody wants me to send him this these games you can actually i mean the pgn so you can put in some notes and whatever with all my commentary just um send me an email to valeri.willow at gmail.com or just a message from my website tagalilov.com i'd be very happy to uh send you those examples. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, please check up the link below the video, which offers this fantastic 49 courses at 60% discount by some of the top grandmasters and teachers from the Chess 24 website. Take a look at it. You're going to love it. It's it's fantastic course. So um, now let's take a look at another very instructive game. This time we're going to see what Kramnik had seen that made him be very, very successful in a game against another top grandmaster. So hold on, strap up. This is going to be a pretty intense game. We're going to see. Just a second. Mm -hmm. And this time I'm not telling you the result, actually, although you probably know what I'm talking about already. Just a moment. Okay, here we go. This is it. So, Kramnik versus Aronian played in the Turin Olympiad in, uh, 
what year was it? 2006, 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. 10 years, and it still feels like yesterday. That was a, such a fresh game. So Kramnik is known as a very positional player. So as opposed to the previous game, here we have a very quiet beginning. C4, B6, G3. This is known as the English opening. One of the quiet openings, mainly based on White's idea to develop. And then he can actually focus in the center. So step by step, things look good. G3, C5, bishop to the G2, bishop B7, castles, D4, G6, D4. Okay, then black exchanged, and white takes back with the queen. Now that's sort of counterproductive. A queen in the middle is never a good idea. It loses some time, and black can attack it. So that's not perfect. But white wanted to get the Marozzi bind structure. Essentially, from the English opening, we can have that very important pawn on c4, which takes away possible challenges by black, just as a6, b5, together with d5. And so thereby, if white actually gets the control of this square with maybe the rook, or perhaps just with the pawn, this c4 is going to guarantee a solid space advantage to white. It's called the Marozzi bind, and it can exist out of many different systems. For example, I love doing it in the Sicilian. Uh, when I was younger, I had an eye, a lion which uh, actually didn't prove to be as aggressive, but almost 90% of the time it gave me a fantastic advantage. I saw it for first by at first by one of my major competitors, um, Grandmaster. He, he further on became one of the best Azerbaijanian Grandmaster, uh, Altai Safarli. His name was, I'm not sure if I pronounce it well. He used to play that incredibly well. and. Uh, I used to play that after, I mean, I, I tried to play that after him, not that successfully, but every single time when I played it, it was just a fantastic game because of my C4 pawn and the fact that it took away Black's counterplay. In the Sicilian, it works pretty well, so it challenges Black. Here, White's trying to achieve the same thing. Now, I know there will be people who argue this is Valeri not winning for White, so what are you talking about? Sure, I just think that White has a solid upper hand and a pretty good opening with that. I, I personally love having positions of this kind. White didn't even bother to play e4. He wanted to conduct his development quickly. He now develops the rook, a6, pawn to b3, making sure this pawn chain is concluded. Pieces are good. So black castles. And what do we do now? Now we're going to talk about strategic positional chess. Now, before you close the window and say, oh, Valeri, you're going to start the boring stuff. Now, it's so good so far. We just saw a brilliant sacrifice on the checkmate in 16. I want you to teach me how to do that. Before I teach you how you can actually checkmate in 16 moves, I want to tell you, you can't do it unless there is a, some special mistake by the opponent, like in the previous game, special circumstances. In most times, we get this boring type of game, really. We do, and it's not boring. It's just the way some people think about chess that they consider this boring. So, what you have to do here, the first thing I recommend is you start the early middle game. Like once you've already completed the development, you start the early middle game with improvement. Step by step, taking the pieces up and bringing them. One of you recommended a fantastic idea, and I love it. What if queen h4 takes place? Now, to some, this move look just means nothing. It's why would white want to move his queen in the corner? It's good in the center. Well, for one, because it could be attacked. But more importantly, it's because it A's the bishop h6 move, and ultimately the knight g5 idea. Now, because this is probably the most important moment in the lecture, from all the examples I'm going to show you, I want you to remember this. There are three phases of any successful strategy. First phase is development. This means bring your pieces up out as quickly as possible. That's clear. Then we have the second stage. It's called improvement or adjusting your pieces. That's when you make them actually better. That's when you connect them. You, you take the right circumstances. And then when you create those circumstances, there comes the final stage, which we actually call attacking or, you know, engaging. 
It's important to remember these three stages and how they work, because unless the opponent makes a big blunder, like in the previous game, that gives us an opportunity for a direct tactic, you need to take this slowly and go one step at a time with gradual improvement in the middle game. That is the stage which I call improvement. So in between the, op the opening development in the middle game, late middle game attack, there is the improvement part. And you have to do it while you have the time, while your opponent hasn't improved on his own. So, now, until now, did Black make a mistake? No, not really. I mean, maybe because he played a little passively, but nothing special is going on. So Black played Rook C7. And I want you to pay attention at Crown Nick's moves. He did nothing but improvement. Another after another after another until his position was strong enough so he could strike. The queen is good now. This bishop is coming. So white gets this bishop too. Now, um, black didn't like to play this passive game. So he actually tries to play queen v8. This move x-rays the b5 square. So eventually black will push the pawn. And after that bishop's removed, like he makes changes, eventually this will give him some open lines for counterplay. Let's see if anybody can tell me a good move for white at this point. Just give me a good move. Like, tell me, oh, Valeria, I'd love to play that. <laughs> That's a good, that kind of good move. So, what do we do now? <clears throat> a4, bishop h6. Okay, let me comment on those moves. Knight g5. Oh, knight d5. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Knight, let's go with knight d5 first. This is not a great move. Now, why? Because it engages. Now, this is a little problem that players have. They engage too fast, and they go for moves that look good. What looks good isn't always good. Remember that. I want you to think about exchanges or, I would say, engaging moves like that in the longer run. Like, how would it work in the longer run? In the longer run, it would work bad. He will give him the open line immediately, not to mention that this will be a weakness. He can come back with his knight. We've only helped him to get a perfect counterplay. Come on. We can't do that. No, no, no. We shouldn't. What about bishop h6? I mean, that, isn't that what we, what we came for? Just get the bishop up and enjoy I like I like such moves. I mean, it's truly they're truly good. I know for the most part, it's it could help a lot, but he didn't do it. Why? I mean, what's wrong with that? It's just a good move, right? I mean, didn't, didn't isn't white what white played for? Possibly, but black would have played just rook f c eight, and then if we do the exchange, he'll just take back. So you see, white's ready, and he isn't. At the same time what's the trouble so was it something wrong with it i mean bishop h6 wasn't a good move but why come on like isn't this an improvement before i answer you that question i'd like to bring out another suggestion what if we play bishop d4 okay that's another suggestion by one of you black would just play b5 as planned takes capture and, um, well, it's a nice position, I agree, but that's about it. Nothing can go. Now, knight x to b doesn't work. So trade, take, and now our knight's going to hang. So we can't do that. <clears throat> What's the problem for white? I mean, come on. You got the development, and you almost feel like you should attack. I mean, there's nothing more to improve. It, probably the bishop going to h6, right? And we got a challenge. Now, two things happen. First, there is no energy. Now, energy is a very simple concept. In world, we know energy to be the one thing that fuels everything, whether it's going to be your electricity or it's going to be your dreams. Either way, you need energy for that. In chess, energy is just as necessary and essential for your attack to work. The problem with bishop h6 and all these moves is that despite our hard attempt, there's just no energy for white. So how do you explain energy in chess? Energy is that opportunity that arises when a few pieces get to work together 
towards a single weak point that maybe sometimes isn't weak, but when the pieces are together, it becomes weak. So you get to see that the first thing we need to do is to connect the pieces. But hey, bishop h6 sort of connects them, and it didn't help. I mean, we could do knight g5, or maybe even earlier knight g5, and yet that wouldn't work. Why? Because he wouldn't bother. He'd play b5. Take, take, and there's nothing. There's just nothing on the king side. Damn. So, obviously, it's not only about that. So what else helps us to make stronger energy against the opponent? So we have coordination of the pieces, but still that doesn't bring it up. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's quite important to understand you have to plug it in. Like, imagine you want to start your lamp. You may have the lamp, but you're not going to get the electricity until you actually plug it. And it's very important you do the same thing. Having the coordination means that your lamp is ready, but it's not lighting yet because you need to plug it. So what's the missing piece right now? Now, what Kramnik did with the next couple of moves showed exactly what was most necessary, and that was the possibility to actually pose pressure. Let me show you how he did it. He played bishop g5. Now, pressure is a very interesting concept in chess because without it, our peers will just look together. Like, you could say that this king and the pawn are coordinated, and that will be a completely false claim, yet they look connected. So why they're not coordinated? Because they don't pose pressure. If you want two or more pieces to be truly coordinated and truly to work together, you must find a way to make them pose pressure, to challenge the opponent in some way, or to make him stay behind. When the bishop and the queen come on that diagonal, that actually helps white to create certain problems. Knight d5 can come down now with an attack against f6 and possibly e7. So it's not just going to be about bishop h6, a sort of aimless attack, but essentially this move creates pressure. So if you want to create energy that will give you possibilities, you really need two things. One, you need good peace coordination, and two, you basically need to find a way to put pressure. That was really important. Ultimately, now white can even play, I mean, okay, here the rook is going to get, the knight is going to get pinned, so I can even exchange and play knight g5. That would be really dangerous for black. He can't move the knight due to the rook. If black doesn't play this, if he just waits, uh, like with something of rook to the d8, then we have knight d5, as I mentioned earlier, and you can see that the pressure these two pieces keep against e7 makes it very difficult for black to plan ahead. You know, and that is a big deal thing. We have the e7. So I want you to understand the concept of energy. It's not something that I'm making up. It's really the reason why people don't succeed with their attacks. Now, I want you to picture it like that. This is one of the methods that one leads to the other, leads to the other, leads to the other. So let's break it. Let's break it down to, 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 to its core elements. If you want to have a successful attack, you need threats. If you want threats, you need to have good pressure. In order to have good pressure, you need to have good piece coordination so that a couple pieces or more than that work together. And in order to have good piece coordination, you need to have good development. So one leads to the other. Development leads to coordination, leads to pressure, leads to threats, leads to the attack. You see, that's how you have to break it down, and that's how you can easily recognize if some of these particles is missing, which will ultimately falter your whole plan. So even a logical move like bishop h6 wouldn't work in that case because we just don't have that energy. You know? Whatever we do, however logical this may look, it's not about how it looks. It's about, about how it is. So bishop g5 is a very deep move that when you can see it broken down to its core elements makes a lot of sense and ultimately helps us to realize what things, what particles are necessary for us to find out a move of this kind.
So Black saw knight d5. He saw the pressure. He knew he, re he knew he couldn't push that pawn due to the move of rook takes d6, and uh, uh, ultimately <clears throat> Black was in a in a bit of a trouble here. Simple and strong now. I totally agree. Now one of you just said I can't see the screen clearly. Uh, it's blurry. Now this is because of your resolution. YouTube will basically adjust the resolution to its lowest if you have a slow connection so you can basically click on a button i think it's one setting button and then you can increase the resolution that that will make it sharp that will make the screen sharper it's just it's the youtube and the setting that it has it's it's by default anyway bishop g5 black took on f3 so white took and now black fought it is a good opportunity to to, to follow up and uh, maybe attack against the, uh, the the queen side. So he actually picked up to follow with uh, the move b5. Exchange takes b5 was interesting. So what do we do now? Anybody? What is the black queen doing on BA? Okay, that there's a very interesting discussion about that queen out there. So strange. Yeah, she's taking a sun bath. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> of course. No. How can she leave his man alone? Oh yeah. That's it. it well, I mean, I guess the, the man on GA doesn't really need its queen at the moment. But yes, I agree completely. Okay, so let's see. Uh, now, after the move, okay, what course do you recommend for these theories you're teaching now? Well, the Huga course that's provided in the, you know, by, by Chess24. It has all the Grandmaster lectures with all these things and more being taught to you. I'm going to send a link so you can check it up. It's a pretty good one. So, here we go. Uh, this is basically the link. You can check, click it or look, look it below below the video. All right, knight d5. Nope, no, nope, no. Knight d5 is fine. But it's not going to work because black would ch change it. And then in case we play with c6 to the d5, he'll play uh, probably even f5 he can do. I mean, who cares about that e7 pawn? We might take it. And yet after rook e8, we have already the double pawns. We can take on d6 because if we do, uh, you know, like basically black could do rook takes the c1. He can attack d1 and it's going to be dangerous. I don't like that. So, um, no, 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 no. See, this is changing the position too much again. We don't want to change the position too much. We don't want to do that now. No, come on. We need different moves. Knight e4 is interesting. But then black will just play rook e8. So it's really not going to make too much trouble to black. See, the pressure is gone. We wanted knight d5, but it obviously doesn't work. So what else? Bishop takes d7. I love that. This is a great move. The moment white did it, obviously black can't take back with the knight. And then when he takes with the rook, then we have knight d5 come down. It's pretty good because now the two black knights that were very important defenders are gone. The e7 is being targeted, and uh, apparently black is kind of losing it. He played. He could have played f6, but uh, I mean, you can see for yourself, bishop e3 or bishop h6. Either way, the pawn on e7 becomes extremely vulnerable, so we can set our rooks together. It will be bad. And uh, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it. If you place anything else, like rook c7 is what black did, in attempt to give up the pawn, but at least get some activity as before, I found an incredible move to follow up with. What do you guys think? What should white do now? Just one move difference. Oh, yeah. Bishop takes d7 and then knight d5. Does the double pawn on f3 really matter? I don't think so. See, black is completely unable to reach it while white is already attacking. In a sharp tactical position like that, those real those actual pawns don't matter. No, not really. Not here. Shall we take the pawn? Well, we could. But then black is just going to get out. He'll play rook e8, challenge the bishop. Yes. That's the move we need. Rook c6. This is great. If black exchanges, we get a strong pass pawn 
and that's going to really torment Black as it will take one of his big pieces to defend it. And uh, truth be told, uh, White's Rook is going to come down too. So in case of the exchange, retake, Rook C8, Rook C1, and uh, now that pawn is simply devastating Black's position. Okay, so Black played E6. <clears throat> He's hoping to consolidate somehow. He wants to consolidate the position to keep everything together. What to do now? <laughs> Alrighty. We got the good pawn. We got the good rook. But we haven't got the good win. We haven't got the way to convert it. Now, I would like to talk about conversion. You see, that is the hard part. Everybody can get a position to an advantage <clears throat> in one way or another. But being able to convert it, like find a way to actually win or at least get to a winning position, is difficult. It's probably the most difficult part of the game because it requires precision. It requires an ability for you to you know, like figure out how to do it and make it good. Like here is a good suggestion that I got, like bishop d8. That is called a fancy move. When it comes to tactics, a lot of people like fancy moves just because of the look of them. However, remember that fancy moves aren't as great unless you can actually see how they provide you an advantage. The bishop d8 doesn't do anything. While well, black will attack this pawn, it will attack the f3 should we move, and our bishop is hanging. What's the point? No. Mm -mm. White needed something else. Bishop f4 as a move, um, I suppose, but uh, it's not going to work. Nope. If we do bishop f4, he'll just play queen c7. He'll stabilize. Nope. You need a plan. Now, whether you want to play tactically or positionally or just universally, connecting both of them depending on what position you have, you need to always have a plan. The plan basically has one goal. You figure out that goal, then you picture the right candidate moves that will follow it, and that's about it. You execute them in the right order. What is White's major goal? Now, you said bishop f6. Not a bad idea. I agree. This is fine. But then black will just play queen b6. He will attack the pawn. Before I tell you the goal, I'm, I'm going to let you to think for a little bit more. Can we play um, queen f4? Well, that, that's fine. At least you wouldn't let the queen to come out. But uh, what if black just plays bishop e5 in that case, just pushing you back or so, like d5? Um, you know, that's not going to work too great. That's why it's goal. Why not open the lines on queen side? You know, I don't think that's so bad. But white had something very different in mind. We want to utilize this pass pawn as an incredibly good piece to torment black. So white played bishop d2. I just got that suggestion. Very strong idea. The bishop suddenly comes right back, and as we can see it, it's going directly towards a5. I think the goal is to support the pawn and tie black down. Exactly. Thank you. That was very helpful. Very good suggestion. What this move... Kramnik, in fact, uses a backward square for a stepping stone towards a much better position. And now you realize that if black plays queen b6, for instance, there's going to be c7. And you can't take. Oops, we have the queen d8 if he takes, or queen e7. <clears throat> so this is a great idea. Of course, black plays queen c7. But then white plays a4, as one of you recommended. So once you have the goal, okay, I want to focus on that c6 pawn, you do two things. One, you bring as many pieces as possible against the opponent. And two, you think about opening up more lines. That is essential. a4, d5, a x to b, a x to the b, queen b4, which actually happened in the game. And then after rook to the b8, there was queen a3. Now, all that white wants and he needs is to just open more space. So he doesn't really need to do anything more than that. Let's just get the pieces and have them come down, and uh, it's great. With the queen, now white's preparing bishop a6 as well. So black played bishop d4, 
queen a6. Then we have bishop, to, okay, bishop a5 is definitely coming, so black had to do bishop e5, f4, bishop d6, bishop a5 comes forth. Then there is the move of uh, queen c8 and queen a7. And it's kind of amazing how white just keeps black on the downside at all times. There's nothing that black can do that could help him in, in a different way. Uh, it's it's amazing. Step by step. F4 was a great move, by the way. Thank you. This was great. Just to push him back. And then the queen comes down to A7. Um, Rook A8. Queen B6. And, uh, well, you know what's great about these positions? You don't have to hurry. Like, literally, I, I like to tell it that way to my younger students. When you're playing a winning position, it's like you're eating an ice cream. If you eat it too fast, you're not going to feel the pleasure of it. But if you eat it too slow, it's going to melt. So the idea is you want to find the balance. But more importantly, specifically about a chess thing, you need to keep the pressure, the tension at all times. Now, with tactics like bishop c3 and using that pawn just to hold down black's queen, you realize how difficult it is for him to play this. c7 comes. Apparently, black has only one way to go. I mean, if he plays rook b7, we got queen f6. So he has to go to a8. And then we have queen b6. Bishop f8. Bishop takes b4. So bishop takes b4, queen takes b4. And uh, black just played queen e8, and then he resigned, seeing that all that white has to do is just to move his queen and rush that pawn down. But what happened in this game? I mean, <laughs> come on. Black didn't have such a bad game. Well, what went so wrong? So going back from the very beginning, let's see the reasons why Black got into this trouble and what are the few critical lessons you can learn from this. First, similar to the previous game, although it wasn't as tactical, remember that you need more space. You need more control. You need to have more command directly against the opponent. It was so beautifully played by white with the move of queen takes to the d4 and the way on how white did it. The space that you get in the opening is the most critical thing you can have to give you good circumstances. The second is the phases. We have the opening development, the middle, early middle game improvement, and little, late middle game attacking. That's how you can remember them. We have finished the, the development, but we need to improve. Something beautiful that Kramnik did was to basically make sure he can improve his pieces and basically coordinating them. In a way, the coordination must lead to pressure. So he put pressure versus f6 and e7 that Black didn't have. It was great, it was knight d5, so Black was scared and he decided to go fast. More importantly, now we see the third key lesson. You have to be active at all times, not just in the opening. Moving up with such ideas like rook c6 is fantastic because it just holds so much pressure. And the tension for against black, it was unbearable. I love also the idea of one goal. See, people often calculate and calculate and calculate a lot of things, and they get confused out of all these calculations. So instead of making all these calculations, why don't you just stop and think of one specific goal, one particular area, and then focus your moves or candidates out there. That looks that that sounds a lot better and much easier to follow. Less complications, more of an easy route. So this is how it worked. It was beautiful and it was effective. Did Black have to play a rook takes the c6? Probably not. But then, okay, what was the wrong move for him? Like, where did he got in, get in this trouble? I didn't answer the most important question. It was a bad game for sure, but where did it really go bad? I think it was when you exchanged an F3. I mean, you know, white, probably he shouldn't have exchanged there. He should have just allowed black to play, white to play knight d5 and maybe taken there with the, uh, with the bishop. Like here, takes, takes, and <clears throat> even though I wouldn't say that he could win material due to Rick Day, bishop takes the end of this, I still think that it's not that terrible game. After rook takes to the c1, it's uh, he can even do knight c5, and he can hold it together. Slightly more preferable for white, but hey, I think that uh, black can hold. 
Now, I mean, this could happen eventually, B4, whatever. We'll see how that goes. But then again, uh, that was the better alternative. Very interesting game as to what you have to remember and, and keep in mind when planning and how positional work, positional chess works differently than tactical play. So is knight d7 a good move? Wasn't knight c6 better? Yeah, there are a lot of questions like that. But re in reality, uh, it wouldn't have changed much because white already had that special c4 pawn, which I'll call the Marazzi pawn. And it was great. So again, if any of you wants me to send him the uh, actual games from uh, from today, please don't uh, don't hesitate to email me. I'm going to bring my email on the chat again. So um, yeah, there's there's this valeri.lilov at gmail.com. So please um, take a look at that and send me your your questions or your you know like your. Um, request for games or whatever i'll be more than happy to help out also on my website tagalove.com now i got two questions you're saying that you should have more space but grandmaster bane feingold says never push your pawns because you can't move them backward he says that you should be careful about pushing your pawns these are two different things in the opening you want to push them in a careful way but when there is obviously no weakness or no risk or, you know, the typical move, gaining space is fantastic. So be careful. Yes, but do it. According to open to opponent's pieces, okay, let's see what the question is. According to the opponent pieces, what are the rules to develop our pieces more successfully? Bring them on advanced squares as further as possible, closer or within the center. That's all. This is what you can keep in mind. Now, Valeri, there are a lot of books on strategy. How to understand them. When it comes to books on strategy, work out the principles that masters are trying to amplify with each example. Don't just go through the example and forget it. Try to make a summary. I've always recommended when you study strategy, make a little summary with some of the key notes or key points. Uh, can I make a, uh, like a playlist? Sure, I've made already one. So, Now, one of you said, what is the best way to read chess books? Should we complete each book? Be selective. That's my suggestion. There is too much material out there right now. You cannot learn all these for a lifetime. But that's so great. What's so great about such a course like the course of Chess 24 that basically they provide you with an opportunity to select some of the key topics and really learn well all about it. So I do recommend as much as possible that you get to do this. Uh, so yes, I think it's uh, it's a quite good thing to study. Now let's take a look at another game I'd like to bring to you. So just one second. Okay, here we go. Now, this next game is a super interesting game that was played by Sergei Karyakin, who is going to be a world championship challenger. Oh, yeah. And he played it versus Vasily Vantrov. Similar to the game of Gelfand, this is a brilliant game to talk about, and I think you can learn a great deal from it. So let's, let's talk about it. Just a second. One moment, please. I'm just trying to copy the game and make it good. All right. Here we go. It should be the right one. Yes, Sergei Karyakin versus Vasily Ivanchuk. That was a terrific game. Let's talk a little bit about it. What was this all about? Karyakin was playing white, and he started with e4. I'm not going to tell you what it's about until we get to the key point. So d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6, pawn to f4. Then black played bishop g7, knight f3. This is the Pierce 
I've never really loved it as an opening, although it has some interesting ideas. Usually the best way to fight the Pirates is the Austrian attack. It's very active, quite aggressive, and it provides White with a lot of space and control. After Black Castle, White played Bishop d3. He's developing the bishop so it can protect the pawn just in case. And then after Black did knight a6 castles. Black's cool idea is to counter White's middle, but it doesn't come as easy because White's playing d5. And then later on, in response to the preparation of b5, so we can challenge our knight and bishop, White played a4. <clears throat> b6. Then we have the move of queen e1. Now, black plays e6. Now, queen e1 is usually in order to bring the queen over, and in a position of that closed character, I suppose we have the time to regroup. So now the question is what to do. Black's intending to challenge our center, so it's a good training question. What do you think white has to do now? Now, uh, one of you said, uh, okay, and how, like, let, let me, by, by the way, while you're thinking, I would like to answer a few questions. What are the book you recommend for this key topic on strategy and everything? There are many. I love My System by Nimzovich because it's really good. And then there are, there are some others like, you know, on, on positional chess. But you can start with My System. Now, what else? How to set strategy in opening? Well, that's what we're going to see right now. More importantly, in the opening, it's about developing, gaining some more space, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, yeah, basically trying to acquire as much control as possible without ruining our formation. Now, what to do here? E5, be active. Well, you want to be active, that's for sure. But if you do it right away, it just wouldn't work as, as good. I mean, think about this. The moment we play E5 right now, Likely black is just going to take the d5 pawn and we lose. No, we can't do that. And yet you picked up the right idea. White has to be fast here. He needs to do things quickly. So e5 doesn't quite work. What else can we do? f5, that's probably fine. But your move should be, first of all, you know, like avoid risk. And then the second is you need to make sure to gain more space and command. With the D takes to the E that white played, F takes D, then white played E5. So I'd like to uh, tell you about something interesting. This is a tactical sequence happening in the opening. Why and when can we do this? Strategy and tactics in the middle game is often dependent on the structure that's already being created. So it's easy to find out if you need of a more positional or more tactical approach. But how do you decide on that when you're still in the opening. Usually you don't. All you really need to do is just to think about, uh, you know, development, and eventually when you get ready, you can decide more. However, try to remember that on many occasions, if you're given an opportunity to create a permanent weakness inside the opponent, or to take some great control without jeopardizing your development or your position in general, you have to take it. With the move of e5, we realize that white isn't going to jeopardize neither his development nor he's putting himself at risk, while at the same time, having a knight like the one on e5, or actually what I believe he wanted, he wanted which was more or less f takes d5, and then, uh, you know, there could be this amazing bishop g5 plus knight e4, would have given him a long-term advantage and great resources for no risk at all. That's the move. e5, knight f to the d5, and knight e4. So are you really allowed to start attacking in the opening? Yes. If there is no risk, if he doesn't jeopardize the development for more than one or two moves, and yet it's going to give you long-term advantages, you can basically make the exception. Something interesting that White got here was the extra control that was based on the e5 move. And then further on, White continues with bishop g5, queen d7, queen h4, and after knight b4, white sets the rook on d1. Now I want to emphasize on the concept of energy, which I mentioned just a moment ago. Every single one of the white pieces has this tremendous energy that brings black down. 
Even if he comes back to f7, there's knight d6. There's the x-ray of the white rook against the black queen. And so when it moves, like for example, somebody will say, Valeri, why doesn't black take that pawn? You get to realize he doesn't do it due to knight f6. And uh, after bishop takes f6, <clears throat> there could be bishop takes f6. So there are, now there are a couple of different threats. c3, pinning down the knight. If the queen back goes back, this bishop takes g6. Otherwise, there's queen h6 and there's knight g5. Wow. So black didn't do it. Black couldn't. So he played queen c6. So how do you suggest white has to break through now? Things are good. We've already can you know found the candidates that help us to gain more space. What to do now? Take a moment. Now, one of you said it's very hard to visualize a weakness or create a weakness. Well, you, when you understand how weaknesses work, it shouldn't be so hard, really. Now, let's talk about this. Is energy more important than, than things like bishop pair? I wouldn't say so. It really depends on the position. We call these imbalances in chess. Sometimes you have to sacrifice one to get another. It really depends on the position. But usually what, what can provide us more immediate possibilities in a tactical or more of an open game, that's what we care about more. Given that White has such an open position, he cares a lot more about things that he can use rather than some long-term other type of you know, advantages. He created the long-term weakness. He gained the long-term quality. But right now, it's about tactics. Is energy the same as initiative? No. The energy is potential. You know, it's, it's control. It's the challenge that your pieces can do against the opponent. It is an all consistent word about what gives you the shot against your opponent. A balance between good coordination and pressure of the opponent creates the energy, the lamp, and where you plug it. So, now, what do we do now? Knight f6, good job. But it wasn't just knight f6. Now, how should white take? Pawn, bishop, or something else? What do you suggest white has to do next? <clears throat> hmm. Now, knight d6 could have been played, but you see, that would have been a little bit of a deviation if we did knight d6 before. White wanted to just use that knight to destroy the black bishop. So anyone who has a suggestion here, what do we do? Bishop. Bishop takes f6. Yeah, that's not bad. It's not that bad. We can take. But then black will likely take on the d3, and then after that, he will play, um, you know, knight d5, and it's kind of okay. I still think we have a good control, but it's not going to be that perfect. Now he was threatening the bishop. He's going to have a decent chance. So, no. What else then? Pawn? Sure. Pawn can work. But if we take with the pawn, he's still going to do that. Takes. And now because due to the challenge in G2, he'll be safe. He'll stabilize and he's okay. Damn, you could definitely go with that, queen g3 and knight e5, but I think the black will get a chance. So, no. And you're probably getting my point that uh, actually white has bishop takes g6. <laughs> and that was fantastic. I mean, like, this comes from the two words. Fan, I'm fanboying right now, fantastic. Yes, it is fantastic. After bishop takes g6, a6 to the g6, bishop takes f, we got a checkmate threat. What this move, what this sacrifice provides is an incredible follow-up. And more importantly, now black has no way to deal with the destruction that each of white's pieces is going to create. There's a checkmating threat coming in a couple of moves, not to mention knight g5 coming out when the black king goes like... He plays something. It doesn't matter what, like, say, knight x to c2. You're probably wondering, could it lead to a checkmate? You bet. Check, check, checkmate. So, can't do that. Look on f6 with the rook. But then blow, oh, white played with e takes f. And, and then we have the challenge of f7, knight e5. And then after that, black is in a deep trouble. 
he had to move the rook, but then after queen g5, black just resign, simply because wherever he, wherever it goes, it's like it's game over. Not h4 with an, with an incredible attack, and f7 most likely. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's just it's just a disaster. If he comes back, we have rook d7. Now this is only a result, but what I want you to understand from this game is that. Essentially, active development and center control matters. What helps you, however, is when you keep that potential. Sometimes you can even start attacking early. Yet if you don't risk your position, and if you're going to get permanent, you can create permanent weaknesses, if you can get tremendous advantage of that kind, with little risk, I guess it's a pretty good deal. Something that White got was a fantastic energy of the pieces, which are both coordinated and creating pressure. And it helped for a beautiful positional preparation and a great tactical outcome. Those are the two things that help you to connect tactical and positional chess. So you don't have to bother, when do I play positionally or tactically? Combine them, and then you have a winning game. I do hope you like this game quite a bit. I mean, like a lot of um, a lot of actually interesting ideas uh, in in these uh, games. I've taken those games from the Chess Twenty Four Fantastic Course. Once again, I do encourage you to get it. It's like more than forty nine premium courses by top grandmasters at a fantastic cheap price of si in, and sixty percent discount. Take a look at it beneath the video, or you can check on the link that I just put in the chat. I thank you all for joining me today, and uh, if you want me to send you the PGNs for those lectures, you can please email me at valeri.lilov at gmail.com, or just visit my website and send me a message. I'll be glad to send you the file and also answer if you have any questions that you may have. So my site is um, tagalilov.com. Now, um, in your opinion, which players' games are great combination, tactical, positional strategy? I think all the Grandmaster games that are good. So, absolutely. Now, uh, so um, I, you, one more one more question. You said, okay, I play this as black. Can you please inform us the same position in black? Yes, I'm definitely going to be having some lectures on openings and how to play good as black, repertoire for black. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be sometime soon. So thank you again, and I wish you all a good weekend.